Hi, my name is Kateri Tuttle, and I have been with Dream of Wild Health since September 2019 as a program coordinator. Um, I work with uh, the Dream of Wild Health um, programs in general, but I um, work um, particularly with the Indigenous Food Network program. The Indigenous Food Network program is a collaborative of different nonprofit Native organizations in the Minneapolis area, and uh, and the. The IFN is comprised of many different organizations trying to work together to um, create opportunities for healthy Indigenous food education and access. Some of our main partners are NACTI, Bedote Learning Center, Center School, um, and we are definitely proud and happy to be working with them to be doing healthy Indigenous food education and access activities such as the one tonight. Um, I also, this is a program that is housed within Dream of Wild Health. Um, Dream of Wild Health is D Dream of Wild Health has a 20 acre farm and a year round youth programming. Uh, we work with our indigenous seeds and youth to increase food access and knowledge of healthy indigenous life ways. Um, one way we do this is through um, our youth leadership programming. The next one. Um, so without further ado, I guess I would like to talk about Elena Terry. Um, I'm really excited to have Elena with us tonight. Um, Elena Terry is an Indigenous chef who actually has been working with Dream of Wild Health in the past. She was able to come out to the farm this last summer and cook some traditional foods with our youth. The youth were incredibly excited and happy to um, spend time with her, and we're really lucky um, to have her here tonight. Um, Elena Terry is the founder of Wild Berries Catering Company. <laughs> and she is from Wisconsin Dells. She works with the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance Mentorship Program as a mentor coordinator, and also with the Intertribal Ag Culture, Agriculture Council as a Great Lakes Region Chef. Elena is also a chef for the Indigenous Mobile Farmers Market out of Dane County, Wisconsin. All of these jobs are geared at building a stronger community with education and support through food. Elena believes that the more ingredients are cared for and showcased in a way that people can relate to, the better chance they have at sustainability. It's all about having these amazing ingredients with their connection to our ancestors and the stories that go along with them for our future generations. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Elena Terry and um, thank you everyone for coming. Hello, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> thank you for the wonderful introduction, Kateri. And thank you for having me again to help support with Dream of Wild Health and all the amazing things that you guys do up in the farm and uh, for the community and for the youth. That's what it's really about. So I always love to help participate with this. Um, so today we are doing a hominy candy demonstration. And I know that there's a lot of resources out there where you can learn how to make hominy. It's really a neat process to uh, do the nixtamalization of the corn. And it, it, it opens it up in so many ways. It opens it up in flavor and texture, these nutrients get released. And there's so many different stories. I'd really encourage you to kind of do some research on how different tribes do nixtamalize their corn or you know, transform it from this beautiful seed into hominy. And there's a lot of reasons why we would have chosen to process our corn this way. And uh, there are a lot of different ways to process corn, but this is just a fun way to, to do it, there's, I have some examples here. And we'll, let me start with the seed. I love using um, this blue corn, but there's so many different varieties and uh, whatever you have access to, really you can transform and nixtamalize. And I, I would just make sure that the corn that you're using doesn't have, you know, things that will contaminate it or taint it when you transform it or when you process it. Uh, so I have this beautiful blue corn here. And what you do is you really want to get it soaking and cleaned really well. You want to boil it. And then you want to add your wonderful wood ash. And I know I get asked a lot about where I get 
the ash that I use for my corn. And because we need a lot of very clean ash, and I happen to be uh, friends with quite a few people who like to smoke their meat, I usually go to those people, <laughs> like even famous Dave's will, uh, you know, give me wood ash because <laughs> they know that I use it to process my corn or, you know, for the gardens and stuff. But I just actually keep it all the time in my kitchen. And we use a small sprinkle of this when we make, you know, our corn mush, when we do anything with corn nuts from the seed, because it doesn't only kind of activate those nutrients, but it just opens it up and it adds a lot of flavor. My good friend, Chef Tanya Brandt, I remember cooking with her at the Pokhagen Great Lakes Intertribal Food Summit, and uh, she left her corn overnight in the ash and, and in the water. And the next day I was like, oh, you know, we should really rinse this. It tastes, you know, you can really taste the ash, but that's the way they prefer it. And um, one of the things that her mom said was, you know, that it just has this extra level of nutrition when they do it that way. Like me, I don't leave mine overnight. I like to rinse it several times and kind of slowly change the process. So I'll start with a large, maybe like a cup for a kettle of corn and then let that process for a little bit and rinse it and kind of rub it in my hands to get some of the skin off and then put it back in and add a little bit more. And I like to take my time and I'll spend the entire day making how many, you can ask anybody in my family because I, I do it all the time. And we've been making a lot of hominy lately because we've come finally to the point where from the harvest, we are able to go into the winter and start figuring out what our food needs to be and what our seeds need to be. So we're starting to make some of our hominy now. And one of the things that we do is we'll make it and then dehydrate it so that I like to give this out to the community members that might not have um, the resources or access to the seed, but this is what it kind of turns out as once it's been processed and dehydrated. So let me show you the process, Tommy. I started with this this morning, and just as I've been kind of doing my work throughout the day, have processed it, and this beautiful how many came out. So it's opened up. I like to have this for the candy a little bit more bloomed because I'm going to put it in a food processor to break it down a little bit more and make it an easier chew with the caramel we're making. But um, you can kind of process it to different levels and then dehydrate it or freeze it or whatever, however you want to preserve that. And if you want to, I know some chefs that I work with process it about three quarters of the way so that when they're ready to use it, they just complete the process and then they're able to infuse flavor. So there's so many different ways that you can treat that. I also wanted to share um, some of this beautiful white corn that we processed into hominy. Oh, I'm throwing it around. And it, they all have their unique flavors, their unique components. And, and I love that I'm able to access them because they are so different in, in composition. But you can see from the blue corn, I'm just gonna put these in my hand side by side so you can see that there's such a significant difference just between these two that you can see how much the transformation would be when you use this in cooking. So when I use the blue corn, it turns out quite a bit different from when I use this white corn and it's processed. Or even when I dehydrate it, when I rehydrate it, it's going to be a little bit different texture than when I cook it and use it fresh. Or if I cooked it three fourths of the way and then continued cooking it when I used it later. So there's a lot of different ways, and it's really about what you prefer, what your resources are, even for storage. You know, I like to store some of my hominy frozen, but not a lot because it gets a little bit hypersaturated when I want to use it again. But we just don't have the freezer space for that. So I like to dehydrate mine, and then I can keep it, you know, in, in jars and in my cupboard. So it really is a personal preference, but it's an amazing thing in the scientific way that it transforms and it just kind of, it's, I like to think of it as you're like waking up that corn and you're like, it's ready, it's time to eat. You know, it's time for you to nourish us and it's time to be used. And this is, you know, this is what you're here for. And adding these different components like 
the hardwood ash just amplifies what is already so incredibly delicious and pure in that corn. And you're adding this like natural nixtamalizer that uh, wakes everything up and adds flavor and nutrition. And then your corn is ready for you and you can process it however you want. My kids and my family here love corn and it, it's amazing. I'm so glad because, you know, years ago we wouldn't be eating like this. We, we weren't eating like this. And I've always thought, and especially when I've been at Dream of Wild Health, I'm kind of on the other side, in the middle ground, I should say. I'm not on one side or another, but I like to teach what I'm capable of doing at home with my family. And I am not able to be decolonized. <laughs> I'll just put it out there. I love our indigenous ingredients though and the flavors that they add, but I need them to be relatable so that my family will eat. And, and how do we make these transitions relatable so that you go from eating out three times a week to eating in with our indigenous ingredients? Say it doesn't need to be all wild game and all wild food but we're using these ingredients in a way that our family is getting that unique nourishment. And so when I was at Dream of Wild Health over the summer, we were kind of challenged by the, or I was challenged by the kids to, to make something different. You know, like, you think you can make sushi for us, Elena? And I was like, if, if you have the equipment for me, let's do it. We're, I'll show you how to do it. And we used squash and kale and wild rice. And I think we had salmon. We had a fish in there, white fish. And, it was amazing to be able to show them, like, it doesn't have to be exclusive and it doesn't have to be any type of rules around the way you choose to eat. But when you make those choices, try and incorporate our ingredients because they provide something that only they can provide. Like you can get a lot of white rice from a lot of different places, but this wild rice nourishes you differently and it tastes differently. And it gives you a connection, not only to the people who harvest it and process it, but, but to all those generations behind us that have shared that same flavor, sensation, and texture. And, and it's just a different kind of way of eating. So what I wanted to share with you today was one of the treats that we kind of make in our own house here. And we love maple, you know. I mean, it's so amazing and it's talk about variety and then the varieties of corn and the flavors and they just kind of naturally go along with each other. Uh, <clears throat> I know a few years ago, I think it was a braiding the sacred. We were like, oh, we want to make some kettle corn, but we're going to make it out of hominy and use maple sugar. And it was so easy. The biggest thing that you have to worry about is that that corn does hold a lot of moisture. And if you're doing something like deep frying it, which is what we we did when we made the um, the kettle corn, you have to make sure that that moisture isn't going to, you know, pop and, and have a complication with the oil. Or like when here we're making this uh, toffee candy, we want to make sure that the hominy is dry enough because that hydration ratio is going to really throw off your end result if you have too much liquid in it. So it is something that you want to um, consider. What I do for mine is I just put it on a baking sheet with a towel and let it dry for a while. As long as it's not, you know, shiny wet with moisture, it's good. And so I'll start with this and I have an induction burner here. You can see a little bit more. For those of you guys who know, Zoe's helping me today. <laughs> But I have a cup of butter in here and I'm going to add a cup of maple sugar. And this is just um, Zidi Mijawang maple sugar and that's it. And I'm going to turn it on here to um, like, um, medium, medium high. And the key to this is temperature and stirring. So I have a candy thermometer, they're, they're like $5, but it makes a significant difference um, in your end result, if you kind of monitor the temperature. So with maple sugar, it's a little bit different. If you've ever made toffee from um, white sugar, refined sugar, you want to bring that toffee up to 290 degrees. And that's what that candy thermometer is for. It kind of keeps it enclosed and you can keep the temperature 
monitored. Um, but with the maple sugar, it's slightly different. You want to bring it up to around 282 and then let it go because if it goes a little bit higher than that, it has a tendency to break. So my biggest recommendation when you're doing this is just keep an eye on the temperature um, and keep the heat constant and then also stir it and stir it occasionally. You don't want to stir it too much and you want to be very gentle because if the sugar goes up on the sides, you're going to start getting burning and um, it'll affect the entire outcome. So you want to just kind of gently stir it, but keep an eye on it. Um, I'm going to, do you want to show them what that looks like though? So that's my setup there. I have my candy thermometer on the side and then just my butter and my maple sugar and it's slowly starting to melt and blend together. And I'm going to take around three quarters of a cup of the dried hominy, not dry dried, but I had the dried off the sheet pan hominy and I'm just gonna put it in the uh, food processor and pulse it a couple times to break up those larger kernels because uh, you want to make sure that your bite is evenly textured. So give me just a second while I do that, and I'll show you what it looks like when it comes out. I'm going to let that go just a little bit longer. This is what it kind of turns out as, and that's the texture I want, where it's a little bit more grainy and not quite full kernel, but you also don't want it to be just like pureed down. You want people to know that they're eating corn in their candy. So, I'm just going to keep stirring this and talk to you a little bit. <laughs> it's really just a matter of waiting this out and not rushing it and, and letting it really kind of marry together into this beautiful candy. I also have one teaspoon of vanilla. I personally love adding vanilla into my stuff. And I have some hazelnut flour here that my good friend Kevin Finney hooked me up with last year at the Indigenous Farming Conference. Um, and I like to sprinkle that on top because it's, it's uh, a candy <laughs> and toffee and it's so delicious. And I just love the flavors. It, they, like I said, they kind of naturally go together. All right. Just to give you an idea, Right now, I'm around 190 degrees. And I'm just gonna let this keep going here. So I'd love to know in the chat, I don't know if um, one of the ladies could help me read the, the answers or the questions, but um, are there any questions right now? Do you yeah. have any questions that came through? <laughs> um, so first off, someone was asking if you could tilt the camera a bit down so that they can uh, watch as you're stirring. Yeah. <laughs> you can see what I'm doing. Again, so that you can see it when it, it gets to a point that it's kind of interesting. I want to make sure that it's not like this heavy rolling boil, but just this kind of soft boil and that I, I don't let it get too, um, too hot in one spot. And so right now I'm already up to... ...245 degrees. So it's getting there and it smells am amazing. So we had a, can you tilt it so that you can feel it? Right? <laughs> so you can see it's just a slight boil here, but nothing like too insane.
So I have a question for you, Elena. Yes. Someone was asking, uh, may I ask a little bit more about how dry the hominy should be for candying? Should it be fully dehydrated? Okay, so the fully dehydrated is this, like, this is fully dehydrated. And it's, it would take a lot to, to rehydrate that. What I want is this where it's, it's got some texture. And when you're done with the candy, you're really going to have to refrigerate it because you have to keep track of the corn a little bit. So I want oh, it to be slightly dry, but not like fully dehydrated. I just want to draw that moisture out that might seep out once you add it to the candy and, and change the consistency of the candy. So I want it dry, but it doesn't, not dehydrated dry, not like corn flour dry. All right, we have a few more yeah. questions if you want to answer a few. Yeah. So okay, Amy, great. Amy, Amy had right. asked, sorry, Tyra, I wrote these down, so I was just gonna make sure that we read them off real quick. Um, Amy had asked in the chat a while ago, um, she has a wood burning stove in her house for extra heat and can she, and, and she uses wood from her property whenever there's storms. Um, could she use that ash? And then she also said, what do you mean by a clean ash? So you can't use a, a fir tree. You have to use a hardwood, like a deciduous tree. I like to go to Famous Dave's because I know that they use hickory there. Or if I have a smoker, it's generally going to be like apple or, or cherry, like a, not a pine because that won't work the same way. You have to, it has to be a hardwood. And clean, you want to have, you know, ash that's not contaminated by, you know, something else. And in the food industry, I know that if I go to somebody who's smoking that wood, that that ash isn't going to have other components in it. Like, you know, if it, if it isn't going to be from a construction site or something like that, that you want that wood to be clean and, and pure when you're processing anything with food. All right, Zoe, do you want to see where we're getting? So we're, we're kind of getting up there, and I'm going to keep an eye on the temperature now because it'll start to change pretty quick. And when it does, I want to move fast enough that it's... Uh, going to kind of hold together here. And sometimes, um, especially with sugar or caramel, you with the oil, it'll you can have a problem with breakage, and uh, that could be because of heat or uh, because of too rapidly warming it. And if that happens, you can try getting it back together with a little bit of water, like a tablespoon at a time, but. For this, you wouldn't add more than just a couple tablespoons of that to have it be the case. Mm -hmm. And I just want to check here. With my temperature, I am almost there. And it's kind of, you can, I don't know if you can hear it bubbling, but it's almost to that point. What I'm going to do is really quickly add, you can show them Zoe, so that they can see. You can see that I'm almost there and it's starting to come together. And what I'm going to do is pull this, add my corn, add my uh, hazelnut flour and just a little bit of vanilla here. So I'll pull it off, the heat. 
And then I'm adding, we can show them so. To this now, my nice little caramel mixture, my corn, and my hazelnut. And of course, if you don't have access to the maple sugar, you could make uh, the toffee and, and add your corn to it. But I just, I love using the maple sugar whenever I can. And it's, it's got this, it's better for you with your glycemic index. It's got this unique flavor that, it's just a little bit more earthy and it complements the corn really well. So I have a prepared pan here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and pour my candy in. This one. And then, so there you go. It's not as caramelly as, uh, as what you might think with toffee, but it's, it's unique, it's different, and it's absolutely delicious. So definitely try it. And um, I can share because it's just one cup of each. Like I said, the biggest thing is uh, warming up your sugar to the right temperature and, um, and stirring it and then also If you have the maple sugar, just know that it's going to be a little bit different chemically than it is than if you had the white sugar or brown sugar. And there's a lot of recipes out there for toffee. Like I had been saying before, when you think about our indigenous foods, a lot of people are intimidated by them and and they're a little bit worried about trying something new. Like not everything always works out and it's neat to try it because your flavors are there and the textures are there. And if you have the idea, it's worth trying, right? I mean, not everybody is successful in their test kitchens. And I think like with the sushi, with the candy, with wild rice pudding, all of these amazing combinations and, and different ways that you could treat these incredibly delicious ingredients, to, to try it and to do it. And there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, you know, I like to look at different um, recipes and just think like, oh my gosh, if I could transform this or change that, how different it would be. And, and we just sometimes try it out and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's great to know that when you do have something as beautiful as corn with so many varieties that we have of our indigenous corn that you can change things. It doesn't have to necessarily be with maple or with, you know, butter and sugar. You might want to do something different with the soup or treat it differently when you make bread, which you can do with the cornmeal. And I mean, there's so many beautiful things that you could do. I just like to encourage you to try that and know that everybody has successes and fails in the kitchen and there's no obstacles that you should just be like, oh, I'm not meant to do this because it's about trying and, and experimenting and knowing what you like and the flavors that you like and, and just seeing how things turn out. So I encourage you to do that in your own kitchens. So I don't know if you have any questions. I was just gonna say that brings me back to the work that you did with our youth this last summer and the sushi that you made with them. I think that our kids, uh, our, our youth at Dream of Wild Health are definitely a little bit more familiar with some of these indigenous ingredients. Um, and I think that they were just really excited to make something that they're familiar with uh, pop culture wise, sushi, something different culturally um, using traditional ingredients. And I think that's really, really cool. So I see there's a few questions coming up, but I don't get to, I don't really get to see them too much. Uh -huh. 
One of the questions that is here right now is what's the ratio of, Christine is asking, what's the ratio of corn to ash to water when nixtamalizing? So I, you want to add a significant amount of ash, but not so that it's like entirely ashy. I don't know what size a uh, kettle you would be using, but, and I process like these bag of size amounts of how many would I do it. So I don't normally do a small pot, but I would say with the size of like a regular kettle that you would use about a cup to start with and um, make sure that you sift it. I have all these different levels of sifters here from like a tiny mesh one to this mega one and even bigger based on the size pot. So I've been using this just to get it started with like this kind of a sifter, all these different things. Probably a cup I would add to this, but I wouldn't fill it the entire way. So this larger pot, I might add it three quarters of the way. You have to make sure that you leave room for it to bloom, which, uh, you know, if you're using, some people I know don't have the same equipment at home. And we've had to use Instapots to make hominy. And, and with those, we would use like a half a cup, but it just depends on what you have available at home or, or what you, um, you know, the size kettle that you use or even how your kettle is. Like I don't generally use that kettle. I'll usually use a larger, heavier uh, based kettle when I, I'm doing it. Are there other questions? I would definitely encourage anybody to not be shy now. I know that we were kind of watching intently at the sugar and the butter. I was kind of mesmerized myself. So um, feel free to just think about what it is you guys might have to shoot at Elena. Elena is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to traditional native food sovereignty and cooking in general. Um, so if anybody has any sort of questions, definitely feel free to ask. Oh, Rebecca is asking, what is the texture of the candy when it cools off? It's like a caramel. It's, so it's chewy, but it's not, um, we might get there during this time, but it might not be super cool. I like to let mine cool for a while, but um, even now, like, so this is, it's, it's a little bit less chewy now and solid, but you can kind of see what it turned out looking like ah, without a reflection there. And it's slightly solid, but it's not super, super chewy the way you would think that um, caramel would be. It's a little bit more like, oh my gosh, I'm, I just want to do it. I'm going to. It's so good. It's got like this texture of the corn and the hazelnut and the maple is in there, but it's a little bit like buttery. When it cools, we'll add it just a little bit of <laughs> salt. I know, I'm sorry. I've been looking at it and smelling it and I was like, I just have to do it. I just have to taste it and make sure it tastes good. I know there have been times when we've made a similar candy and we haven't taken the sugar quite so far and we didn't blend the uh, hominy quite as much. We, so we left it as whole kernel and then we just kind of drizzled that on top and it ends up being like a, a a candy corn or a kettle corn. So it just really depends on how you want to process your uh, the sugar part and what temperature and texture you want to take it to. But you can transform that into so many different ways. I know I had this like incredible, it was like a drink, but it was sweet like this. And it was made out of hazelnuts and uh, Taylor made it in Meskwaki, or I mean in Pokagon, excuse me, and it was so delicious. And just adding those sweetness components like the maple sugar to it, something as delicious as a nut, it, it's incredible. And heating up that maple, you can change it, you know, from the sap all the way to the sugar and the candy and adding other components like this fat, the butter. I mean, traditionally, 
we had fat like duck fat. Could you imagine what duck fat, maple sugar, corn, and hazelnut tastes like? No. I bet it's in insane. But this one, uh, the, the drink Taylor made was like liquid, and it didn't have corn in it, but it was nutty, and it was sweet, and it was delicious and like developed. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can treat those ingredients, like I said, and just slight changes will completely transform your end result. So if I, you know, did the caramel a little bit differently, it could be hard, it could be like a toffee, or it could be this like, this rich kind of juicy, sugary goodness that the corn and the, the nuts absorb and then kind of solidifies the way that this candy is. But you can definitely change it. I mean, I think it's amazing to just come up with these ideas and to be like, I think I can do that and then try it, you know? Um, I think I was with Tanya and Crystal and we made some popcorn and we added it to a creme brulee and it was like the Dakota popcorn. And we added like how many chunks to it and made a creme brulee and then topped it with the popcorn. And we were like, I just want it to be as corny as possible. What can we do? And I, I we also had like this hunter's feast and I was thinking, how delicious horchata was and, and this, how they are able to flavor this rice drink and how can we transform corn and make it similar with those, uh, you know, more distinct flavors like the cinnamon and, you know, those spices and add it to the corn with some sort of transformed nut milk and bake it and have it have that, you know, where you have the flavor of this horchata, but you know everything about it is corn. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> Krisha, I saw that comment. I love it. <laughs> I love corn, you know, and I think it's just that when you start thinking outside the box, when it comes to our ingredients, it's not limited. And they are, there are a lot of ways that we appreciate this, like squash or the hominy or the maple. And it doesn't always have to be savory that, that you can, really whatever you can think you can do when it comes to food. Are there more questions? I was giving you a second there. Um, this is a question that came up a little while ago, um, but Kathy asked, I have real maple syrup. Would it work to use half of that and half white sugar or <coughs> maple sugar? <clears throat> so you kind of get to that moisture issue again. Uh, I know that if you, you could use like brown sugar and maple, and that might be similar when you think of complementary flavors and like the level of moisture that you would be having, but it really is a chemical reaction that you're looking for and, and having those, that, that candy kind of transform. But I think that you definitely could do just maple syrup and cook it down and then add your corn and, and have it be this like kind of crack candy, you know, it, you could cook it down to any level that maple syrup and add sugar to it. And then your corn or whatever else you'd like to add to that and then get it to the consistency that you'd like to, if that makes sense. But it might not be like the caramel that, that you're thinking of, but it wouldn't have to be either. It's all about flavor and what you prefer. So you definitely could do it if you'd like. And then Krisha, I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name, uh, but uh, they asked, could you use it to coat popcorn or is it too heavy? No, you can definitely use it to coat popcorn. I wouldn't take it all the way to like the 285 degree. I might take it a little bit less than that because once it reaches that, it, it really shifts into that caramelly flavor or, or texture. But um, yeah, definitely it, it's an, it would be incredible to put on popcorn. And then Neely is asking, uh, how do you store it properly and how long will it keep? For this, what I do is just wrap it in wax paper like you would any other um, candy and put it in the refrigerator because it is corn. We it, it never lasts more than two days here. So I'm not too sure what the extended shelf life is, but I, th I would imagine anything that you would keep in your refrigerator. I, I, we don't like to keep anything longer that's perishable than, you know, 
five to seven days if if that was the case for it to be in our refrigerator still. All right, anybody else? Any questions? Hey, Tara, I think you missed a few questions. Uh, I asked a question in the chat and I know that there's somebody or it looks like Rebecca asked another question too. Some of these questions have been shooting in pretty uh, furiously the last couple of minutes, I'm sorry. Which one did I miss? Do you know which one? You can read it too, Tyra. Okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm just going up to the top to make sure that we didn't miss anything. I don't think we did. Uh, did you ask about the texture of the candy when it cools? Yep. Okay. Um, Rebecca said, I'm thinking, yep, asked about packaging it. I had asked, maybe it was just my question. <laughs> so I had asked, um, I want to, I'm planning on making hominy candy and then giving it away uh, to friends and family for the holidays. Do you have any other recipes or foods you can think of that would also make good gifts? One of my favorite recipes is it, and with blue corn or white corn is uh, these cookies that you can make uh, sugar cookies with the maple sugar also and uh, roll them out and decorate them however you'd like, but they're so delicious when you can taste the corn flavor in it. And it's what I like to do with my cornmeal is substitute out around a third of a cup to a cup. And it, it will vary because that ratio gets pretty significant when you have a lot. So if you were doing like, you know, six cups of, of unbleached white flour, I wouldn't use that same ratio because then, uh, like I said, it's all about when that corn opens up, how much moisture it's going to need and how that will affect your recipe. So with, like a sugar cookie, if we were substituting out a, the blue corn for some of the, like we use unbleached flour, I might say for a six cups of white flour, use one cup of blue corn or just to kind of vary it and see. I know I, know I have a few recipes out there, but that's one of my favorite and that's one of the things that uh, everybody around here likes we give them away and you can add jam to them or you could you know put icing on them like any other sugar cookie that you would use for the holidays but it's really just adding like I said that connection and, and saying like yeah it's a it's a sugar cookie but it's corn it's a corn sugar cookie you know and it's blue and it's so delicious and then adding those other flavors like I I just made a batch the other day and I added some of the uh, red lake choke cherry jam to it and I was like oh my gosh these aren't even gonna make it to where they need to go <laughs> because I had to keep quality testing them you know and making sure that they turned out okay but I'm, I'm kidding it's being able to do that we use blue corn flour in bread in biscuits and and everything is a thickening agent for gravy, and which is perfect for, by the way, if you add a blue cornmeal, you don't need a roux, which is kind of naturally thickens because when it blooms, it opens up and absorbs all that juicy flavor. So for gravies and stuff, we, we just use the blue corn or the white cornmeal for, um, for our flour substitute. So it's, Really just thinking, knowing that you can do it and that sometimes it is a, a hit and miss. I'll tell you that the first time I made those uh, blue corn sugar cookies, they were a little bit dry. And I was like, ooh, I think I need to make this different or, you know, add a little bit more of that. And, and just knowing that the more you use it, the more you're going to want to use it and the more you're going to want to bring that into your house. And I think having it in ways where you can use the blue corn meal for a flour to thicken a gravy or to enhance the flavor of a sugar cookie. Talk about what an incredibly diverse and, and transformative ingredient, you know, like that you can really honor the flavor and say it can be sweet, it can be savory, it can be a flour, it can be a full kernel of corn. And in all of these ways, it's nourishing us 
beyond say, you know, sweet corn that you might be accustomed to that it has these unique qualities and all of these corn varieties have these different stories and where they came from. And I mean, it's just a beautiful thing to really delve into. And, and I absolutely love finding more varieties of corn or seeing the corn that people have grown and their connection to it. Um, you know, I, I loved being in Oneida and seeing all of that incredible corn that you got there, Becky, or when I travel, you know, up north to Dream of Wild Health and to Little Sky Farm up there to see these other varieties of corn that are our ancestral corns or, you know, just those connections. I love that something as beautiful as corn is able to bring together community and to feed us and to make us think outside the box and to say like it doesn't have to be exclusive but it do also doesn't have to be like exclusive about the way you consume it either you can definitely you know change that up and if any of you guys ever have a question about that feel free to reach out I mean it might take me a couple of days to get back to you but I love talking about food and food science and just really thinking about different recipes so if there's something that you're thinking of I would love to help you figure out how to make that happen too so just putting it out there thanks Olaya. are there any more questions I think I saw a couple questions come in yeah we had the same question um a few times in the chat people were asking where to source hominy from and blue cornmeal um I know that like on our social media we shared a few a few links to uh resources from toasted sister as well as like the um the made by uh, American Indian uh, resource as well. But I, and there's also been a few people who have been typing in resources into the chat. Uh, so to thank you to, to everyone who's been doing that. But I also wanted you to give, to give you a chance, Elena, um, if you had any resources of where people can find uh, Hominy. Well, I do work with the American Indian Foods Program and with um, various farms like Dream of Wild Health. And I think that being able to look on those references, sometimes it's just a matter of people having a smaller amount or, you know, with us, one of the struggles that we do face is, um, you know, seed multiplication and making sure that our genetics and our seeds are protected. And so sometimes people only have a limited amount. There are people like, um, like Dave Smoke that has small batch handmade hominy that's incredible. I mean, he's the corn mafia. I think I saw Emily put it out there and, and he sells it. Uh, there are various people in American Indian foods that, that sell stuff like that. If you put it out there on any one of those sites, I think on Facebook, like, you know, the indigenous foods network or, or however it is on, um, I know there's like food sovereignty pages and stuff that I've always see different references. Like, does anybody know how to get this? Or does anybody know how to get that? But I know that I have to buy in bulk and I get a lot of my bulk uh, corn from bow and arrow because I love this. The blue corn is delicious. Another question I think that has been asked a couple of times, Elena, is when are you going to release a cookbook? <laughs> So can I tell you, Kateri, Zoe was sitting like, you know, on the other side of the camera when you were giving that introduction and she was laughing because you're like, you know, all her jobs. I do have a lot of jobs. <laughs> I have been working on one and then COVID happened and it, it's like all these pivots started. We had to shift to this virtual world and it just seemed like, um, you know, the writing part got put on hold. I do enjoy writing and I have a, I have a degree in philosophy and political science. And, uh, you know, I was always I was teasing the other day, like everybody was saying, what are you going to do with a degree in philosophy? Well, I'm going to write a cookbook one day, <laughs> you know, come on, of course, that's what I was planning. But I'm definitely feeling, um, I did write a short story for the Intertribal Agriculture Council's uh, annual meeting. And I was blessed to be able to read it 
and and just share some of this journey. I know Rosebud's on the call too, and I would love to have my cookbook be this combination of, you know, what put us on this journey and the foods that nourish us along the way. So once I get that compiled somewhere down the road, <laughs> it'll be out there, but it's definitely something that I've been working on and I have a bunch of notes for. So one day. Well, everybody that's on tonight will definitely be interested in that. I am interested in that. And um, we're at about seven o'clock right now. So um, if there's any sort of last questions, I could probably write them down and see if we could get them answered. Not tonight, but um, just for future reference. And I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, Elena, you're such a great representation of the healthy indigenous food that we're trying to um, kind of push in our community and get everybody kind of excited about. And I think that yeah, how many candy workshops, um, obviously we're using butter and sugar, but at the same time, these traditional ingredients are incredibly important. And um, this is something that definitely is um, really helpful whenever we're trying to create a atmosphere where people are kind of um, going to be able to learn about healthy indigenous foods and make those healthy choices and practice uh, traditional food sovereignty in their lives. Um, but we are really excited that you guys were able to come tonight and we really appreciate you uh, spending time with us to learn about traditional um, indigenous foods with Elena Terry. Um, please feel free to um, email me if you have any questions about the Indigenous Food Network, um, Terry at dreamofwildhealth.org. And um, if you have any other uh, questions for Elena Terry, feel free to reach out to me as well. I know Elena is super busy. I would be happy to kind of um, answer any questions if there's any follow up from this presentation tonight. So, with that being said, Elena, you got any last words for us tonight? No, thank you so much for coming and spending time with me this evening. I love seeing, um, you know, friends, new and old, join. And I love talking about our Indigenous foods. So definitely go home, try some of these things, and um, use us as resources. We love sharing. So thank you for attending and spending some time with me this evening. <laughs>